Have you ever asked yourself, when's Jesus coming back? Right? Have you ever asked that question? Maybe he's coming back today. Maybe he's coming back tomorrow. Like, oh, I, you know, there's been all kinds of predictions throughout church history as to when Jesus is coming back. And now that we've closed the calendar on Jesus' first advent, I wanted to take a week and just look at, at, at Jesus' second advent, his, his return to the earth. When I was young, I, you know, I, I, I would ask God, I would say, hey, could you wait until I get married? Uh, to come back. And then when I got married, it was like, well, can you wait till we have a couple kids before you come back? And some days when I'm with those kids, I'm like, Lord, please come back today. (laughs) You ever felt that way? Uh, Now, when it comes to the end times, people get a little funny, right? some, Some people look forward to it, but I think many struggle with fear over when the end will come and how it will come. You see, Christians get anxious when the topic of the end times comes up, and I suspect it has something to do with sensationalist theology like the tribulation or the antichrist and the six, six, six. Right? And maybe we've seen too many movies or read too many books about the devil coming to earth to terrorize Christians. But I think it all boils down to this. We simply don't know what will happen or when it will happen, and that frightens us. Now, admittedly, the Bible is a bit unclear at times, to put it best, regarding how the end will come about. But we can be clear and unequivocal of and certain of two things. God wins, and God's people will be saved. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, so at least we can get that squared away. You see, Christians read in Scripture that they will be saved, that we have faith that we will be saved, yet Christians also squirm, grow anxious, and fear every time something bad happens in the world. And Christians go especially crazy when something bad happens in the Middle East. On October 7th, one of the worst terrorist attacks was carried out against Israel, the nation, by the terrorist group, which is also the elected government of Gaza. Hamas is an Arabic acronym. Now, I cannot speak a word of Arabic, so please forgive me. I'm going to butcher this. Harakat al makowa al Islamia, which, which means, I, I have the translation, the Islamic resistance movement. But that is also the word Hamas in the, in, the, in the Arabic language, which means zeal. And although Arabic and Hebrew are sister languages, the Hebrew meaning of the, of the Hebrew version of that word, which is chamas, is violence. And violence is what Hamas committed. 1,400 Jews were killed. Many were publicly defiled, beaten, and beheaded, filmed for the world to see. And you've seen the horrors yourself. To make matters even worse, hundreds more were taken as captives. Now, at the time of I wrote this, since then, 105 captives have been released. 138 hostages remain behind enemy lines. The reasons for doing this is because of 8,630 and 30 square miles between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea that we've called Israel since 1948 in the modern world. No doubt we called that land Israel in the biblical story, too. This, of course, launched a new military conflict between Israel and Gaza. One, or more accurately, it reignited the last one. Now, Israel is hammering Gaza by raining down fire on their heads through missiles, bullets, death, and destruction. And incredible horrors of what happened populate social media feeds and news channels around the world. So, how should we respond? You see, we have seen the world divide over this, and whose side the world is on. Are they on the Jews or on the Palestines? And whose side should we take? Maybe you've already decided. Maybe you don't care. And maybe you've thought this is the beginning of the end of the world, and Jesus is coming soon. 
because we have gotten a few of those questions. Now, here's what I really want to do today is to address how should we Christians respond to God and how Christians respond to the world when what seems like world-ending events occur. You see, we need to get the story straight, how it started, how it unfolds, and how it ends. And what we need to do is stand back, see the grand story that God has laid out for us, and trust him. And as for the world, we lament over its brokenness. All right, so that's what I want to do today. Now, the structure of our discussion comes from Psalm chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, go ahead and open to Psalm 2. It is our roadmap for understanding Israel, the Jews, the land, and what to expect. You see, my goal is to provide answers to biblical questions, not to defend or promote one political position or nation over another. Now, unfortunately, in the last 80 years, uh, faith and politics have married in this particular issue, and divorcing them is not easily done. Now, I need to offer something of a disclaimer before we get into this, okay? And that disclaimer is that the church has no official position or doctrine on the matter of the end times or the recent conflict that has arisen in the Middle East. So if at the end we disagree, that just needs to be okay. This is not an issue of division. Finally, know that Mark and I shared numerous conversations on this message to prepare. We worked very closely together on this, and I would say more closely on this message than we ever have on any sermon either of us has ever preached. So I want to ask Psalm 2 four questions. The first question is, why are Israel and Hamas fighting? All right, that's the question I want to ask first today, because the psalmist asks something very similar. All right, so follow along with me. We'll begin, obviously, in verse 1, and it starts out, why do the nations rebel? Right, very similar to our question today. Why do the nations rebel? Why are the countries devising plots that will fail? The kings of the earth from a, uh, form a united front. The rulers collaborate against the Lord and his anointed king. They say, let's tear off the shackles they've put on us. Let's free ourselves from their ropes. The nations are raging and conspiring. But why? Well, look at how Psalm 2 describes the world's nations. They are conspiring against the Lord to be free of his goodness and his righteousness. They are seeking liberty in their own eyes. Now, I believe that all nations in history carrying out, are carrying out the same rebellion that started long ago in the Garden of Eden. Th- that means that Hamas is raging. But that also means modern Israel is raging. Why? Because there is a spiritual battle that is taking place. But all we see is how this plays out in the physical world. See, the Bible reveals this battle to us several times to give us insight into what is the real struggle going on. So in Genesis 3, a rebellious spiritual creature in the form of a snake convinces the first man and the first woman to free themselves from the will and desire of God to pursue what feels right by distorting the truth and giving all sorts of half-truths centered around one simple temptation, to be like God. You want to be like God? Then here's what you need to do. The very next story in the Bible shows what happens when people chase what feels good over what is right. Two of the sons of Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, are named Cain and Abel. And it is a tragic tale of Cain killing his brother Abel because the wild beast called Sin is ready to devour him. You see, the ancient stories then culminate in the Tower of Babel. 
and the people are led astray by rebellious spiritual beings as they try yet again to overthrow God with the same temptation to be like God. We see this occurring in Deuteronomy 4 because Moses tells us in that chapter that God assigned spiritual beings to govern the nations. All right, I, I know that might be a new concept. Let me say that again. In Deuteronomy 4, Moses tells us very clearly that God assigned spiritual beings to govern over all the nations. Right? He's then going to reiterate this at the end of the book in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. Moses recounts the Tower of Babel. Okay, he's recounting that story, and this is what he says. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided up mankind, he set the boundaries of the people, right? He's drawing the lines on the map. According to the number of the heavenly host. See what he said there? He drew up the map and he said, all right, you spiritual being, you get to govern this nation over here. Then you get to govern that nation and you get to govern this nation. However, there is one nation that will be mine. And that is Israel. We see this again in Daniel 10, when we are allowed to see behind the veil of the spiritual realm and see these spiritual beings governing the nations, waging war against God's people. Now, allow me to be clear here, all right? There is a persistent theme that runs through the Old Testament, if you're paying attention for it, that shows that God gave the leadership of the nations of the world over to these spiritual beings called the heavenly host or also called the divine council. But God kept Israel for himself. That was his nation to lead. You will be my people and I will be your God. But then those spiritual beings of the other nations rebelled against God by leading their nations to pursue injustice, violence, and oppression. We find the same theme in the conquest of Joshua, in the prophet Ezekiel in chapters 25 through 33, in Psalm 82, and in many of the conflicts between Jesus and the demons that he encounters in the New Testament. This is the Apostle John's vision of the nations in Revelation chapter 12 through 20. The fallen spiritual beings use the nations like prostitutes, fulfilling their own desires and then devour them when they're done. You see, as a result of the nations following, uh, leading these nations uh, to follow the spirit of violence, These nations, the people and their their leaders fall into cycles of violence. So when one nation uses violence against another, the leaders of that nation have only two options at their disposal. The first is politics. The second is violence. Every government that has ever existed in the history of the world has only ever had two options, politics and and violence. So when a nation like Gaza, controlled by Hamas, brings violence against modern Israel, you know they are pursuing the agenda of the evil, rebellious spiritual beings who want nothing more than mankind to destroy itself, to destroy God's creation. They have been fed hatred. They have been fed greed. They have been fed lies by these dark powers. And as their charter says, as the Hamas charter says, they exist to destroy the modern Jewish state that has control over the land at all costs. So what happened on October 7th is nothing more than the sin of Cain. It is Brother rising against brother without reservation or restraint. Why? Because we rebelled against God's order. And as the psalmist says here in Psalm 2, that we see God's justice as shackles or ropes that are in need of shedding. 
You see, you and I commit the same treachery against God when we decide what's right and what's wrong rather than following God. Is it of the same strength, the same destruction? No, absolutely not. But it's of the same spirit. It is of the same rebellion. So Israel, also being a nation of the world, has only two options to respond, politics or violence. And they feel that the first has been exhausted and have turned to violence. So Israel has a right to defend itself, but it is also continuing the cycle of violence and destruction. Unfortunately, people have suffered on both sides of this conflict. Christians have died on both sides of this conflict conflict simply because they were in the way of hatred and hostility now is this conflict really over the land well, what i see are two brothers killing each other because of that old temptation i want to rule with power like god what I see are the rebellious spiritual beings doing their work. So when we see the conflict in Israel escalate to war, it might be helpful to remember Hamas is not the only villain in this story. And Israel is not the only victim. You see, the real enemy is Satan. And who satisfies? he satisfies our lust for power and control. Because we're following that old temptation to be like God. So to win war, the war against our true enemy, we must love our neighbors because our enemy is, is not flesh and blood, but the dark powers and principalities of this age, as Paul would put it. We may pray for those, we must pray for those who persecute us because it circumvents politics and violence altogether. It directly attacks the powers and principalities behind what we see with our eyes. It is the way of the kingdom of God. And sometimes, uh, sometimes wars are unavoidable. I get that. A clear example of that is World War II when you just have to stand up to a bully. But sometimes we also rush to violence. Regardless, innocence always suffers at, in war. And that should trigger lament. So when I see what is happening in the Middle East, it is cause or lament. Now, what is lament? Lament is to pray, come, Jesus, come. Come with all your goodness. Come with all your glory. Just in this madness, in this rebellion, come today and end this struggle. But this rebellion, it's mankind's problem. You see, we continue the cycle of violence again and again and destruction in our nation and in our lives from generation to generation. And we see that violence raging in Hamas and we see it raging in Israel and our own nation has continued this cycle. The follow-up question then, so we've asked one question, why are the nations raging? The second question is, what is God's plan to deal with the violence of the nations? What is his plan to deal with the nations that are being led astray by these rebellious spiritual beings? Well, let's turn back to Psalm chapter 2, right? So in Psalm chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, it says, The one enthroned in heaven laughs in disgust. The Lord taunts them. Then he angrily speaks to them and terrifies them in his rage, saying, I myself have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. You see, God's plan to fix the raging nations was the promised son to crush the snake, enthroned, enthrone him on Zion, the hill where Jerusalem sits. So in the same story, when Adam and Eve throw off the rule of God to their lives, God also makes a promise to Eve as part of the, the curse on the snake. And this is the central plot line that runs from the first page to the last, is this promise that he makes in Genesis 3.15, right? He says, I will put hostility between you and the woman, the snake and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your heel and you will strike 
sorry, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now, this is the first time the gospel is spoken in the Bible. And it is shared by God himself. This promise continues to pop up again and again. And the next time we see it is in the story of Abraham. In Genesis 12, Abraham is told to leave his father's house in Haran and to head down to the land. The land of Canaan. And then he promises Abraham that all the land of Canaan will be given to his descendants. Now this is important because Abraham is old. He doesn't have any children. And after a decade of no children, after a decade of this promise, there's no children through Sarah. Abraham and Sarah tried to force God's hand by having a son through Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar. That son's name is Ishmael. But this isn't going to work because Ishmael is not the son of promise. Now, have you ever noticed when we try to force God's hand, it, it never works? Right? When we try to force his hand, it never works. God works on his timeline, not ours. Right? So church history is riddled with people trying to get God to do what they want even when we're talking about the return of Christ. But that has never worked. For Abraham, trying to force God's hand doesn't work. In fact, it has drastic consequences. So God tells Abraham in Genesis 18 that Ishmael is not the promised son. Another son is still going to come, but he will make a great nation out of Ishmael, and he does. They become the people who live in the Sinai Peninsula and along the coast of Saudi Arabia by the the Red Sea. Now, it is here where people insert a tradition, right? That tradition is that Ishmael is the father of the Arabs and Mohammed, the founder of Islam, his descendant. Now, I tested this claim and and searched for days, but I could find no primary evidence to really substantiate it at all, right? Many people have said that the Israel-Hamas conflict goes back to this issue. Maybe that's true, but I think it's more of a modern one than an ancient one. You see, Mohammed was born in a village we we today call Mecca, And Mecca could be part, could be part, that's important, could be part of the land that's described in the Bible as being given to Ishmael in Genesis 25. But not all Arabs, and certainly not all Muslims, are descended from Ishmael. Abraham himself was an Arab. Instead, that promised son is Isaac. It is through Isaac's descendants that God will bless the whole world. So then Isaac has a son named Jacob, who God renames to Israel. And Jacob has 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel. That fourth son is Judah. And in Genesis 49, God restates his promise. But this time to Judah, he adds... The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Until he comes to whom it belongs, the nations will obey him. You see, Judah is promised a son who will be king. That king is fulfilled then in the promised son of David, who comes generations later. David is a descendant of Judah and chosen by God to become king over Israel. Then when he is king, he is told the throne will never be taken away from his family. Second Samuel 7 says, The Lord declares to you that he himself will build a dynastic house for you. And when the time comes for you to die, I will raise up your descendant, one of your own sons, to succeed you, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name, and I will make his dynasty permanent. I will become his father, and he will become my son. You see, scholars agree that this is talking about more than just David's immediate heir, Solomon. 
God is continuing the same promise that he made to Eve, that he made to Abraham, that he made to Judah, and now to David, that I will bring a son who will be king, and he will be king forever. Well, of course, that is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus, right? Jesus is king. Can we all agree on that? So Jesus is king. Jesus becomes enthroned as king on Mount Zion when he is raised and lifted up. And instead of a throne, it is on a cross. Instead of a crown of gold, it is a crown of thorns. And above his head reads a sign that says, here is Jesus, king of the Jews. Jesus is king. Abraham's family, which becomes the nation of Israel, was uniquely chosen by God to bring the long-promised son into the world to bless it. Jesus did that. He died on the cross. He was bitten by the snake, but ultimately he crushed the snake's power, thus fulfilling his promises to Eve, Abraham, Judah, David. And when Christ is raised from the dead, he has overthrown the powers of darkness and even tells his followers, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Another way of saying that, all authority in the skies and on the land has been given to me. Translation, it's all mine. All of it. And here's why this matters to you. If Jesus is king of the whole world and it all falls under his rule, then even when the nations rage and commit the evils like we saw on October 7th, we can trust that he will have the last word. Right? We have faith that his justice will prevail in the end. In the meantime, we mourn with those who mourn. We cry with those who are crying. And all the while praying for God's justice to come. Come, Jesus, come. Because that is what it means to lament. So now that Jesus has come and, and he, he is king, the third question that I want to ask our text for today is what does that mean for ancient Israel? In short, is the nation of Israel still God's chosen people? Does the land belong to Israel? (laughs) This is where it gets fun. Psalm 2 provides a great platform to answer this question, right? So God counters the raging nations with his king. We get to hear that king speak in Psalm 2. He speaks and he reveals his identity and the message that he has received from God the Father. The nations are to honor and respect God's Son or he will crush them. All right? Follow along with me in verse 7. He says, this is the king speaking, right? The king says, I will announce the Lord's decree, he said to me. You are my son. This very day I have become your father. Ask me, and I will give the nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth as your personal property. Ownership, ownership over the land. You will break them with an iron scepter. You will smash them like a potter's jar. Now, many Christian believers... Preachers, even, and certainly Jews as well, claim that the land of Israel is their divine right that can never be revoked. The promise is made to Abraham that this land would go to his ancestors. It is spelled out in Deuteronomy 29 through 30, if you want to go there and read that some point on your own. It is realized in the books of Joshua and Judges and 1st and 2nd Samuel as they conquer the land from their neighbors. But then something happens. They disobey God by worshiping other gods and idols. They broke the covenant. They broke their promise and faithfulness and fidelity toward God. Therefore, God takes the land away from them. Right? He brings mighty Assyria from the north down and, and erases Israel from the map. And Babylon from the east comes and he takes away Jerusalem and Judah from the south with all their terror, their power, and their might. 
and all the books of the prophets from Isaiah to Malachi are rooted in this single event. Some, some of the prophets are looking ahead, saying, it's coming, it's coming, we need to do something about it now to avoid it, like Isaiah or Amos. Some are experiencing it like the laments of Jeremiah and the anguish in Ezekiel. But some are looking back at it like Daniel or Haggai. But all the prophets are centered on this one event. But they all agree. They all agree, all the prophets agree that God will bring the people back to the land and then do something new, something different, something greater, something that will spread beyond the lands of Israel. All right, let's take a Christmas text, Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. It says, As for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, seemingly insignificant among the clans of Judah, right? Small town Bethlehem. From you, a king will emerge who, rule, who will rule over Israel on my behalf, one whose origins are in the distant past. Now, that's normally where we stop in our Christmas reading. But let's keep going. So the Lord will hand the people of Israel over to their enemies until the time when the woman in labor gives birth. Then the rest of the king's countrymen will return to be reunited with the people of Israel. He will assume his post and shepherd the people by the Lord's strength, by the sovereign authority of the Lord, his God. They will live secure, securely, for at that time he will be honored, where? To the ends of the earth. God fulfilled his promise of restoring the promised land to the Jews when he brought them back to Judah 70 years later. But we also see the representatives of Israel, the people, the Jews from all around the world, as they descend upon Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. They returned to the land, but the land, the real estate, was not the goal. The land was never the goal. The goal was always to the ends of the earth. That was the promise from way back when. The government, or I'm sorry, the covenant was never truly about land. The land was a blessing to show that God could do what he said he promised he would do through Eve and Abraham, which is bless the whole world through one of their descendants. The land was unique. It was set apart. It was holy. But God inaugurated the new covenant. He has brought fulfillment to the law so that something bigger could be achieved than just the real estate, as they say, from the river to the sea. It was always about blessing everyone, about extending the blessing beyond the promised land to all of creation. You see, the church includes people from all tribes, tongues, and nations, and, what, and it is what God had envisioned all along. Galatians 3 makes this, this very point. This is what Paul is talking about in Galatians 3. He says that Paul says that we become descendants of Abraham through our faith and fidelity toward God. Then we receive Abraham's blessing. Chapter 3, verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles so that we could receive the promise of the Spirit by faith. What was that promise again? To bless the whole world through the child of Abraham because of his faith. Now, we all share in the same faith of Abraham, and through that faith, join in his family. Now, let's take a deep breath, all right? Because we're about to jump over to Romans. Why? Because everything always comes back to Romans, all right? So Romans 4 is all about how Abraham is the father of believers, 
he isn't just the ancestor of Jews. He is the ancestor of believers. And then Paul says something incredibly important for our topic today. Verse 13 of Romans 4 says, For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would inherit the world was not fulfilled through the law, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. What did Paul say Abraham would inherit? Was it the land? Did Paul say that Abraham would inherit the land? No. If he wanted to say Abraham would inherit the land, meaning the land of Canaan, he would have used a different Greek word. Instead, Paul says Abraham would inherit the world. The word there is cosmos, meaning everything. You can hear our English word cosmos in there as well. Did Paul quote Genesis 12 wrong? Was Paul wrong in what he was saying about what Abraham would inherit? No, because Paul saw that the point was never about the real estate of Canaan. It was always about redeeming all of creation to undo what went wrong in the garden. And this leads me to the most important point when discussing modern Israel and the issue of the land. We are Israel fulfilled. You see, we have been included in Israel to fulfill the promise to Abraham. Paul uses the illustration of grafting, right, in Romans 11. Taking a branch from one tree, cutting it off, and joining it to a new tree. In this case, the family tree of Abraham. See, the true Israel has never been about political borders or ethnic identities or lines on the map. John the Baptist himself said God could make descendants out of stones if he wanted to. It was always about faith and fidelity towards God as king. So the blessing of the Spirit of God has come to the whole world because the one descendant of Abraham, Jesus the Messiah, died on a cross to overthrow the powers of darkness and set the captives free. We are all free. We are new creations. We are the light in a very, very dark world. Because of that, God, God charged us with taking that message that Jesus is king to the whole world. That means us. The world is the promised land, and God's people are instructed to take it by the same words given to Joshua, right? Remember, Joshua is the one who conquered the land originally, way back in the Old Testament. God promises Joshua, anywhere you put your feet, I will give you this land. And we have the same promise today. Right? We have the same promise. Anywhere we put our feet, that land is ours. But not through violent acts of war or attrition, but through loving your neighbor as yourself. Not by setting fire to cities like Jericho, but by setting fire to the hearts of the lost by the Holy Spirit because time is running out. Right. So whenever we put our feet, wherever we go, we are the ones who are taking the presence of God there which leads me to my final question is this israel hamas conflict the beginning of the end of the world well let's turn one last time to psalm chapter 2 verse 10 so now you kings do what is wise you rulers of the earth submit to correction serve the lord in fear repent in terror Give sincere homage, otherwise he will be angry and you will die because of your behavior. When his anger quickly ignites, how blessed are all who take shelter in him. These last three verses speak of the day of judgment. This is the day when God comes and destroys all of Israel's enemies. The Old Testament prophets look toward this day with great hope. They talk about a king who will bring justice for Israel by defeating her enemies, the temple being rebuilt, and life flowing out from the threshold, and fantastical beasts and dragons of the seas being conquered. So are we to believe that 
the end is near when a king wages war? When there are wars and rumors of war, the rebuilding of the temple, the dead coming back to life, and what we would call mythical beasts being slain? Absolutely. Jesus waged war on the dark powers. He defeated sin on the cross. He is the king who defeated death in the resurrection. Should we look for the rebuilding of the temple? Well, Jesus says that he is the temple rebuilt in three days. Paul and others go on to say that the church is the temple. We are the sanctuary that delivers life to the world through the indwelling spirit of God. We are not awaiting the rebuilding of a temple in Jerusalem. We are the temple around the whole world. Are the mythical beasts being slain? Again, I say yes. The great dragon himself was barred from conquering the church, or as Jesus put it, the gates of hell will not prevail against her. And just one last thing to think about. If we are still awaiting the rebuilding of a temple before Jesus could return, then why would he say to expect him like a thief in the night? Right? So if there were certain requirements to be met before the return of Jesus then why would he tell us it will be as shocking as a middle-of-the-night intruder into your home? If we know that there is criteria that still needs to be marked off, there is no reason to assume that Jesus will return today. But Paul tells us to live every day as if today might be the day when Jesus comes home. So are we in the end times? Anytime something happens in the Middle East, we get questions about this being the end of the world. Are we in the end times? Yes, we are in the end times. But we have been in the end times since Jesus ascended into heaven. We see again into the spiritual realm In Revelation 5, when Jesus arrives in heaven, he breaks the seals, he empties the bowls, and sounds the trumpets. Now, I I wish I could get more into this. I've been tossing around the idea of doing a two-week end times study group in a few weeks. So you might hear more about that soon. But we've been in the end times for 2,000 years. 2,000 years since Jesus ascended. The question then is, Why are we waiting so long? And Peter gives us this answer. When the first century church asked this question, the same exact question, after just waiting only 30 years. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, Now, dear friends, do not let this one thing escape your notice, that a single day is like a thousand years with the Lord, and a thousand years are like a single day. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some regard slowness, but is being patient towards you, because he does not wish for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You see, God is waiting as long as possible for for all who will be saved. The longer he waits, the more the church can do its work. Maybe it's just one more. Maybe we just need to reach one more. Maybe it's our neighbor. Maybe it's our family member. Or maybe it's that person at work who we know needs to hear the the, the good news. Maybe God is waiting on one more before he turns to his son and says, it's time to go. But eventually that day will come when the father tells his son, it's time. He will mount that white horse, wearing his robe, bearing the mark of his blood, declaring victory, and riding triumphantly to the earth. And we will be caught up in that moment, not to be taken away to some disembodied heaven, but to meet him in the air and to create a procession, a triumphant entry, celebrating the return of the king to his home. And all of the spirits of evil and chaos and violence will be destroyed. And there will be no more sin. And there will be no more death. Come, Jesus, come. Amen? So what do we do in the meantime? Well, the lyrics to the song I named the sermon after seem fitting. It opens like this. Sometimes I fall to my knees and pray. Come, Jesus, come. Let today be the day. Sometimes I feel like I'm going to break, but I'm holding on to a hope that won't fade. And it closes like this. One day he'll come, 
and we'll stand face to face. Come, come and lay it all down because it might be the day. The time is right now. There's no need to wait. Your past will be washed by rivers of grace. You see, we proclaim Jesus is king. And we pray for the end of violence. And we pray for the end of hostilities. And we pray for the advent of God's justice. As we plead with God with broken hearts, come, Jesus, come. And while we wait, we turn to our neighbor and say, have you heard the good news? Jesus is king. And you don't have to live in this, uh, with this world like, as it is. Jesus is the true king. Come, come and kneel before the king. And all God's people said, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you today with great humility and great uh, recognition that you are the one who's truly in charge. That your son is king over the world and that we are still awaiting his ultimate return. Lord, when we look around, we see a very broken world that is full of violence and hostilities and hatred. And, and, and Lord, sometimes we stand back and, and it frightens us and we don't know how to respond other than to say, come, come, Jesus, come, let today be the day. And Father, in this time uh, when there are wars going on around the, war, the world and rumors of, war, of wars, we continue that prayer. We, we continue that lament as we are caught in the middle and as we demonstrate our love for our neighbors let us just serve them. Let us love you through service. Let us love you through righteousness. And let us be the light in a very dark world. So everywhere we go, that land becomes part of the kingdom of God. We ask these things in the name of your son, the true king over all the nations. Amen.